webinars which are being jointly organized by IIA India and Protivity India. So an interesting subject today, third party risk management. And I welcome all the participants. So I thank both IIA India, all the office bearers and the team Protivity uh, for all the support in this program till now. I also welcome all the four expert panelists today. Mr. Robin Banerjee, Mr. Rajendran, Mr. Jignesh Mehta and Mr. Piyush Kakkar. So as we proceed ahead, let me quickly uh, introduce myself briefly and then all the four panelists today. So I am CA. Murtuza Onili Kachwala, I am also a Certified Internal Auditor, Certified Information Systems Auditor. Currently, I am Managing Director with Protivity in India. And I take care of the Internal Audit and Financial Advisory practice for West India and I am based at Mumbai. With me, I have all the four experts today. Let me start with CA Robin Banerjee. He is Managing Director with Capri Arms India Limited. Robin Banerjee is a senior professional executive with experience in several large multinational corporations over 20 countries. He is a chartered accountant, cost and management accountant, company secretary, and has a master's degree in commerce. He is currently managing director of Caprians. His earlier stints include Hindustan Unilever as general manager, Arcelor Mittal Germany as managing director, Thomas Cook as executive director. SR Steel as Executive Director, Suzlon Energy Group, CFO and member of the Global Boards. Robin has won several business awards including the recent Ethical Business Practices Award from Rotary International, the Corporate Leader in India by DNA and many others. He was earlier nominated as the Best CFO in India by Business Today magazine. He is currently in the board for Independent Directors, Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, Government of India. He is in the board of SME Chambers of India. He is also the chairman of CII Maharashtra for Finance and Tax Committee and co-chairman CII Western Region for ESG Committee. Robin has written several books including three best-selling business non-fiction books. He is a much sought-after speaker on business economic subjects, a popular columnist, a keen gym enthusiast and loves to play badminton and table tennis whenever time permits. Welcome Robin to the panel. I'll now introduce Mr. Rajendran Arunachalam. He is currently the Group CFO of Thermax Limited. Rajendran is a management graduate from the BITS Pilani and a certified public accountant uh, from USA. He's also completed his advanced management and leadership program from Oxford University, UK. Rajendran has more than 25 years of professional experience working in capital goods, services, and auto component sector. His experience includes strategy, planning, business control, setup of share services, fundraising, MA, and driving enterprise level risk management, etc. He has worked and led finance teams in product, project, and service businesses. Rajendran started his career with Thermax Limited and has worked with Gabriel India and Tata Autocom System. He rejoined Thermax Limited and currently has the finance, legal, secretarial, and exam functions of the group. Let us welcome Mr. Rajendran to the panel. Let me now introduce Jignesh Mehta. He is currently Senior Director, Internal Audit and Controls, Asia Specific, Middle East and Africa with Mondelez International. Jignesh currently leads the Internal Control, uh, Internal Audit and Controls function for Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa region of Mondelez Limited. Mondelez is properly known by the Cadbury and Oreo brands in India. He is also a member of the Board of Directors in a few Indian and overseas Mondelez entities. Before moving to sweeter side of life, he spent almost 17 years with Big Four Consulting Firm and his last stint was with EY, wherein he was a director with the advisory practice. Welcome Jignesh to the panel. We also have Piyush Kakkar with us. He is a chief financial officer with Rebel Foods, formerly FASOS. A finance leader with 19 years experience serving senior management, accountability and strong strategic planning capabilities coupled with business acumen. 
to drive growth under challenging and rapid change environment distinction distinction of deftly improving operations and maximize profits through fiscal controls cost optimization and productivity stock efficiency improvements effective communicators strong business acumen with excellent general management negotiation and influencing team building relationship management and solution seeking skills with focus on group results welcome peesh to the panel so in jignesh and piyush we have two cfos uh, in uh, piyush and mr ranjitana we were two cfos jignesh is an audit and control guy and again uh, robin from the business side and he is also director on multiple uh, organizations and again different industry from a food chain outlet uh, to a cloud kitchen to a fmcg to a manufacturing so let us get started on this interesting panel uh, i also request all the participants if you have any questions you can please use the q and a box and type the questions there and my colleagues will help me in like uh, at the end we'll take all the questions uh, whatever is possible with the uh, panelists so as we start let me go first to piyush and then one by one to all the four panelists on the first question requesting them for a brief opening remark from all of you so in terms of why does organization outsource what activities or processes are being outsourced and what is the re recent trend that you all are noticing i can go to piyush first then maybe jignesh then robin and then rajendran so piyush over to you Thanks, Mr. Matuza, and uh, a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I think, in terms of why organizations uh, go for outsourcing, to my mind, it's more about creating more bandwidth and also leveraging on the expertise. But today's business models have become very dynamic, and hence, it is not always possible that in all the areas there is an expertise that is available in house. So, to go for outsourcing is also about creating a bandwidth. or leveraging on the expertise which is available in the external domain for example any advisory that we want to do or any area that we feel is better managed outside because of in house competency not being there this is the first reason the second is many a times organizations feel that when you go for a new business at a proof of concept stage it is better managed through outsource and only once it needs to scale up you develop into the in house competency as far as your second question on recent trends that we are seeing i think 10 15 years back it used to be that only outsource the non core part of the business but today whether it is to outsource the core or non core that line is getting blurred and organizations have started to see that whatever is beneficial to organization explore a route of outsourcing but keep the supervisory and the management control with the organization thank you thank you piyush i think interesting point you made in terms of the core functions also being outsourced let me also get input from jignesh jignesh over to you sure thanks murtuza and uh, very valid points piyush so largely you know in terms of aligned to what piyush has mentioned i think one of the other reasons why organization should outsource and would want to outsource is also because of uh, you know in terms of benefits of scale right the more you outsource you know the cheaper your operations become so that is one reason also you know with outsourcing you do away with lot of administrative hassle in managing a particular process or managing a particular function i think you know as pius also also mentioned earlier you know the trend was uh, more to outsource certain activities which are non core but of late when you look at it right especially um, you know when the business models are changing so dynamically and it's so very important especially in a company which is in a fast moving consumer space like ours it becomes important to launch the product at the right time right at a rapid pace just to beat the compete which is where let's say you know if you are relying only on your in house manufacturing capabilities or the team that you got in house you may not be in a position to have timely launch of your new products so that's again you know in terms of one of the reasons why increasingly more and more companies are outsourcing 
now coming to your second question murtu you asked about you know in terms of what are the processes being outsourced i think you know when i look across typically anything and everything that is done in house is also currently being outsourced by a lot of organizations right so you know you take functions like manufacturing you take functions you know in terms of like packaging also <clears throat> in terms of warehousing and distribution which is the lifeline of a company which is into an fmcg space those functions are, are com- completely reliant on third party logistics provider right and then obviously you've got non core functions which are more to do with the broader processes right so they are also being outsourced uh, by most of the organizations right jignesh so i think uh, interesting points but uh, like we come to some of the recent incidents also in terms of like warehousing and other things but let me again Uh, go to the other two panelists to get their inputs first, and then we'll proceed ahead. So, uh, to Mr. Robin, sir, if you can also give us your opening remarks and your thoughts, sir, on these three questions. Hi, good evening, everyone. There is an advantage of speaking later part because everything what not what to have been stated has been stated already. So, I'll take the manufacturing uh, ecosystem and paint a picture as to what is outsourced first. the major reason for outsourcing is business model itself there are companies who who are dependent upon outsourcing nike or adidas the world's largest shoe manufacturer does not have their own factory their business model is outsourcing business model. one of the largest manufacturing fmcg company called patanjali they have almost in every brand every product where they have hardly any factories so it's all outsourced so business models are based on outsourcing if you ever wear an hm and shirt h and m shirt or a boss t shirt many of us do wear it's all outsourced zara it's all outsourced bangladesh is the place where they manufacture and they are all saying zara or h and m or boss so there are businesses which are based on outsourcing now in order to do this the key issue in my view which is perhaps not outsourced is qc or quality control and that's the key so when you manufacture zara t-shirt or let us say the manufacture nike shoes there will be someone from zara or nike who will come and inspect the product in terms of quality that is most of the time not outsourced however there are some products which even that qc is outsourced if you are an exporter of fish from india let's say you are in kerala you you export um prawns that will also there will be someone from local kerala person who will check those prawns because it's not possible for them to fly in someone every time to check the prawns every day every night every morning again business models vary but uh, just to give you another example potato chips in india let's say haldiram they don't manufacture all haldiram they have outsourced to small little sh- not households in villages who are making potato chips in their own backyard and then there is someone who will go around and check the quality so again quality is insourced so this is a business model the second reason why of course business model happens is cost zara or hnm or nike or adidas thought that i will make more profits by outsourcing the whole manufacturing what they do they do branding that is where they spend money on all the cost saving or saved they spend on branding and advertising and we all understand the shoe means nike but we don't we cannot we don't think that it's not manufactured with us every football if you if you play a football including world cup it's all manufactured in pakistan but nobody manufactures this big brands don't manufacture it's all manufactured in one country which is pakistan it's fantastic all towels all over the world is manufactured in india so cost of course and third of course is efficiency because if you outsource you are more efficient you reduce cost you spend your money in advertising however in this whole business model most of the time perhaps 95% of the time the qc or quality control is not outsourced it is done by some that person's own own person so areas outsourced i talked about ecosystem i have talked about what are the recent trends i think outsourcing is in growing just imagine patanjali is a 5000 crore company the latest um, unicorn if i may say in the fmcg world okay 5000 crore is unicorn or 7000 crore unicorn we can argue till the cows go home but it is near unicorn and the whole business model is outsourcing 
Babaji has hundreds of products, but everything is outsourced. So to my mind, it is growing. People are spending money and time on advertising and business models rather than building up a factory and spending time and effort behind it. So it is growing. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. So I think uh, uh, Piyush touched upon this point and you very clearly brought out so many examples that like the whole core, the whole manufacturing, which is a key, is being outsourced. But two important things which are coming out, one is the QC and uh, uh, there is one other thing which is like the whole governance mechanism in like how do we look at but we'll come to that a little later let me go to mr rajendran uh, sir your views on these three questions uh, why do organizations outsource what is the recent trend and what type of processes and activities are being outsourced yeah <clears throat> thank you uh, for that and uh... I think uh, uh, I have to agree with all the my co-panelists and who have made all valid points on why organizations look for uh, outsourcing. I think for, uh, coming from a manufacturing background, again, uh, I think the early days of outsourcing was in terms of cost benefits and the looking at uh, whether that's a right approach to take. But I think over the period of time, the uh, outsourcing model has uh, matured and I think clearly organizations uh, uh, as highlighted, have based their whole business model on outsourced uh, operations. And I think uh, that's taken root and strong. Uh, but the important considerations currently are more in terms of uh, business needs, reaching out to mar market uh, faster, uh, as well as there are situations where capabilities, uh, you know, uh, uh, rest outside the organization and organizations make more, want to make, uh, you know, uh, use of them in a faster way. So instead of developing them in house and probably trying to uh, get uh, uh, ability to control, I think organizations are more realizing that it is better to leverage those uh, benefits which are sitting out. A case in point is clearly the digitization uh, journey which most of the organizations are currently undergoing, and uh, clearly IT resources or uh, you know te resources towards technology are not easily available, and I think organizations are more and more looking to. Uh, you know, outsource these activities uh, and probably leverage those uh, benefits of mind sitting outside the organization to drive processes as well as even create business models which will uh, deliver uh, together, you know, um, together along with the third party and uh, in, improve business solution to the customers. So I think, uh, you know, a long way has come. Uh, we have come a long way in terms of this outsourcing model clearly from a business perspective. Sure, sir. Thank you. I think good points which have come out from this first question. And thank you for input to all four of you. Let me move a little to the next one then. So like uh, when we say uh, in identifying a partner or before outsourcing or taking a decision, uh, I'm sure we need to do some form of due diligence, whether we should or we should not. So let me come to Jignesh the risk and control guy like in terms of what due diligence should be carried out before outsourcing Dignesh, any thoughts yeah, sure Murtuza. so i think uh, you know in, in terms of uh, uh, all the points made as to how outsourcing has become so very important let's say if the business has to achieve its objective then obviously if there is so much of reliance placed on the third party it is extremely important that before you identify and get into a business relationship with the third party you do proper checks, right? And, and ensure that you are entering into a relationship with the right third party. So there are various parameters which, you know, which gets evaluated. I think first and foremost, especially, let's say, you know, if you're talking about a multinational company and most of the examples that Robin just gave, right? The example of Nike, Adidas, I think, and when they outsource the manufacturing operations, the first and foremost thing which gets evaluated or wherein the due diligence is performed and there's a lot of time and effort that goes into that is to see whether, you know, in terms of this parties with whom they are entering into relationship, are they blacklisted party, right? In terms of, so there is a process which is called as restricted party screening. So let's say if there is any red flag, which is raised on that particular vendor, either on account of child labor practices or on account of, you know, in terms of any dealings, uh, which are not uh, in line with uh, the relevant laws then those gets identified. And obviously there are a lot of vendors and there are databases which helps us identify those vendors. So I think that's the fundamental check that gets performed, you know, as part of the diligence. 
whether uh, you know the vendor with whom the company is going in for outsourcing is it the vendor that we should do business with right so that's uh, number one second obviously is also you know in terms of to do similar checks on the people on the management who are responsible for you know in terms of running this operations right so you know this operations can be run by companies you know which are uh, designated as private or public limited companies or these are run by partnership firms also and which is where it becomes important that along with you know in terms of doing checks on the organization it also becomes an important point for the organizations to perform a check on the individuals who are running the operations as well right who are basically the management who's running running the operations and then you know the the next important point is around financial stability that becomes extremely important whether you know the vendor is running operations which it can sustain over a period of time and it becomes important you know to look at uh, the balance sheet the pnl you know in terms of crisil also publishes or there are a lot of rating agencies which publishes reports which comment on the financial health of a particular organization so that's another point and then you know off late one of the concept uh, you know which is gaining a lot of importance is around business continuity so you know at the time you enter into discussions with the vendor it's also important to evaluate what are the kind of disaster recovery what are the kind of business continuity measures that the organization has got in place or let's say if they are starting operations on behalf of the company what is it that they would want to put in place so that becomes an important criteria as part of the diligence uh, process that you follow then one of the emerging risks that we are seeing you know in terms of not only from a third party outsourcing perspective but for any company which deals with consumer data right is around the data privacy and that again is a very very important consideration especially you know in terms of uh, when you're talking about you know dealing with uh, with someone or you know you're talking about companies which are european companies which are american companies and more so in europe wherein you know in terms of data privacy regulations are very well matured very well established it's the onus and responsibility on the organization to ensure that you know in terms of they are maintaining the data of the end user consumer safely and in any of the data if at all you know as part of the outsourcing process is getting passed on to the third party then it becomes important that the kind of checks and balances that exist within the organization also exist with the third party so again you know that a concept which is not very prevalent right now in india and maybe it's you know in terms of gathering pace but uh, uh, again this this to me is is an emerging risk and then there is uh, you know in terms of one other thing especially you know in case of multinational companies wherein you know in terms of uh, you talk about anti bribery and anti corruption risk right so again as part of the restricted party screening it becomes important that the vendor that you deal with they don't have you know in terms of any underhand dealings with the government agencies and again as part of the database checks or runs that you do if at all there is any history of the vendor getting into unethical dealings with the government agencies that gets flagged off and also what you know in terms of lot of companies they've adopted as a strategy as in again the likes of companies that robin just mentioned the likes of nike adidas or even for that matter mondelez they have taken a strategic decision to go in with vendors who are globally established vendors so the likes of genpack accenture or maybe you know let's let me just give you an example here in india mrs vector right so when i talk about mondelez we don't manufacture oreo biscuits ourselves the entire manufacturing of oreo biscuits is done by mrs vector on behalf of mondelez again you know in terms of so that's a strategic decision that a lot of organizations take if if let's say they're going in for outsourcing of their core activities they make it a point to go in you know with relationship with vendors who've got good reputation who who have you know in terms of good manufacturing scale and then you know in terms of they can be at peace the rest of the things would be taken care of and one last point i think what's other thing which is important is to ensure that you've got watertight contracts that you enter with the third party vendor that becomes extremely important before you actually start transacting with that particular vendor it's important that the contracts that you enter with the vendor you know it's it's you know properly reviewed by the legal team uh, ensuring that we've got all the right clauses you know which incentivizes vendors to perform at the same time there are clauses which penalizes the vendor in case uh, you know you've not uh, delivered in accordance with the kpis and sles so obviously there are a lot of other things that goes into you know in terms of identifying a third party vendor which is like your business partner 
I think these were just, you know, in terms of few of the important points, considering the recent trends and the emerging risks that we are seeing uh, are important for an organization to be mindful of before they actually sign the dotted line. Thank you, Jignesh. I think you touched upon many, many aspects. So one is the background check of the promoters, then maybe the entity, financial stability, whether there are any non-compliances, looking at the business continuity, things in place, IT protection systems in place. Of course, the contract, and you also touched upon anti-bribery, anti-corruption. So there are a lot of these which you think should be there as part of our due diligence. Now let me go to both the CFOs, first to Mr. Rajendran, and then to Piyush. Sir, the, do we really, does organization do these type of detailed due diligences before we identify our partner and before we go to a third party and outsource, either a core or non-core? Yeah, so um, I think <laughs> there were early days in manufacturing where, you know, when you were outsourcing and that those were activities which were not uh, so large, uh, it could just be involving some processing and other things, which is how things of outsourcing started in the first place. I don't think there were very, uh, very robust processes of checking, uh, you know, the backgrounds of uh, the companies that we were outsourcing to. It was all limited to certain vendor evaluations that was limited to the uh, sourcing organizations to complete. And those were very minimal, to be very honest. But I think over a period of time with, uh, you know, whatever we have been discussing till now about the criticality of the outsourcing, the financial due diligence processes have, of course, got uh, uh, added to them. But more importantly, I think uh, for organizations to look for is really the segmentation of this outsourcing. You know, I'm, uh, you, know you really cannot do the kind of detailed uh, due diligence and the uh, risk uh, risk measurements and uh, mi mitigation strategies etc for all kinds of outsourcing that you are planning to do you really need to understand that uh, whether uh, what is the kind of uh, outsourcing that you have done is it a core activity non core activity what's the level of risks that your organization can face in terms of uh, uh, the outsource partner failing to uh, you know deliver and what impact that could have to you. I think based that, based that uh, kind of an assessment, I, I'm sure that we would have to have processes of due diligence uh, done on the third parties, many of which my uh, uh, colleague on the panel, Jignesh, detailed out very well. I, I wouldn't want to repeat uh, some of them. But I think um, uh, the very clearly those kind of robust checks are clearly needed for operations where organization is going to be dependent on delivering some of its uh, uh, outputs to the end customer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Piyush, over to you. Uh, like uh, when you are outsourcing or like where you've seen organizations where you've been working, uh, what type of due diligences are they so detailed, etc.? Thank you. Uh, I would also agree to my co-panelist, uh, Jignesh, uh, the way he spoke about it, right? From a legal and risk perspective, the kind of checks and balances. Uh, typically, when I look at the business, right, uh, there are around four or five critical factors that are there from an evaluation perspective. And I believe organization has acknowledged this as a risk and the level of diligence has improved over the years. Uh, for If I were to, you know, sort of highlight four or five pointers, one would be the overall business strategy. Is it aligned to the core business strategy as to whether a process needs to be outsourced or in-house? Starts with that. Uh, second is about thinking around the data protection and privacy part to make sure that the data of uh, core business is not subject to risk. Uh, third is about alignment with the partner from a philosophy and a vision perspective, because these are all decisions which are taken slightly from a mid to long term perspective. Yeah. It is very important that when we go for a selection, these points are taken into account. Fourth would be all the aspects that uh, Mr. Jignesh spoke about on the legal side. Right? And when I say legal, I cover the larger gamut from a legal risk and, you know, all the framework, even from uh, ensuring that, you know, anti-bribery and compliance to those laws. And fifth will be definitely the commercial part, which will be covered as part of the RFP process. So these are the kind of five different steps that usually we have seen us taking care uh, as we go for the outsourcing. The second and last point that I want to cover is that there is also an approach that organization decides that if a, if a process has been in-house and you go for outsourcing, typically what works well is to go for a phase-wise outsourcing. Then you also test the effectiveness of outsourcing process rather than risking the entire business at one go. 
and second is that many a times i have seen that to ensure that there is a high level of confidence on the outsourcing process and there is also risk mitigation rather than outsourcing a particular line of business or a process to one vendor there is also some strategy to outsource to more than one vendor thank you thank you piyush i think you made interesting point and again using more than one vendors that is also one important thing which came up i think all three of you given lot of uh, important points let me move to the next question then and go to robin and he can even cover on this but robin coming to you so since uh, you written interesting books on who cheats and how and uh, on the fraud aspect as well so like i'm sure uh, uh, there are a lot of incidents which are happening which we are reading hearing and we experience as well so robin what risks have arisen and what type of incidents have we seen in the recent past when companies have outsourced to third partner third parties yeah first uh, i would like to define what is a risk right risk is an uncertainty that matters it's an uncertainty that matters which means that an uncertain could be uncertain it could be will it be raining on that day now if you're playing cricket raining means cricket game is gone and it matters but if it's a football game raining is good fun slushy ground great fun so that risk of raining depends upon what is the condition and circumstances which we are talking about and that's where the problem lies that we say everything is a risk but there could be good risks and bad risks having said that i feel and i will focus on manufacturing that there are four type of risks which at least i feel there are and the number one risk is quality number one is quality 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 because that is because it depends on business model many of these businesses outsource the manufacturing or they the vendor itself you may not have outsourced manufacturing but we generally outsource vendor that means suppliers supplies like if you are an auto company manufacturer automobile manufacturer an automobile manufacturer has 1200 parts it depends and every 1200 part is outsourced and therefore every vendor needs to source and give the pro material properly otherwise even one material not working the whole automobile may not work therefore quality is the king let me give you an example in the industry i look after we manufacture pvc film and some of this pvc film is it is plastic film made out of polyvinyl chloride used for pharmaceutical sectors mostly it is printed so we have outsourced printing because printing is not esg compliant it's not she compliant therefore we have outsourced it what is the risk the biggest risk is my vendor runs away with my printing logo he or she starts using that my printing design with somebody else so it's a risk so what do you do you change the printer you know when you change the printer first one year two years fine third year he runs it away again he does it printing with somebody else runs away with that logo or with the design so quality one not only it's that the printing should be appropriate and it should be world class but what about the risk of running away with the with the um the trademarks which we have already developed or, or invented so quality is number one risk the second risk whatever we outsource whether it is vendor or manufacturing or whatever the pricing is always a risk if we are a back to back manufacturer from if we are a um, horizontal or vertical manufacturer we are then manufacturing our raw material but if it is outsourced you are you are exposed to vagaries of the pricing fluctuations okay we say you can hedge but you can't hedge all risk all hedge first of all pricing cannot be hedged fully even foreign exchange cannot be hedged fully there are the cfos are all here and i'm sure they will pay me out so pricing is a risk number 3 and very important is formula the biggest risk is can they run away with my formulation i wonder how mondelez runs runs their show that it must be it must be very important for them to have the formula not a can nobody can copy uh, we have we have heard so much story in coca cola how they how they defend their formula the cold formula and it's almost um, a story which we tell to our children saying you know what this is how for coca cola protects its core competence area which is the formula so formula i have seen myself that we have outsourced some manufacturing of plastic films and we have found that they have run away with the formula especially 
if you outsource to China, which is a big outsourcing ground, there are hundreds and thousands of episodes where the manufacturer who manufactures for Apple manufactures even for a small company like Oppo. They have copied the formula manufacturing for the others. And the fourth risk is on time, every time. It must be on time. If the, if the manufacturer or the supplier or the vendor does not stick to time, that's a big risk. So, and how do you protect? Of course, you have to have your quality guy there, you have to have the discipline, and of course, due diligence, which we all talked about, the heritage and, uh, and the type of the vendor which you have chosen. So quality, price, formula, timing. To my mind, these are the four risks which manufacturers, manufacturing organizations, which have outsourced their operations to a large extent, lives with the risk. And of course, we have to have risk mitigations to handle these. But these are the four big risks I foresee. Thank you, Robin. I think four interesting uh, risks which you identified. Let me go to Mr. Rajendran from manufacturing and uh, the other angle as well, the inventory warehousing, which we touched. So like uh, Mr. Rajendran, we've seen incidents where like uh, 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 from a warehouse office in Nokia, the Nokia instrument or an iPhone gets uh, like maybe uh, the, the, it is gets robbed or uh, like siphoned off and it is sold in the gray market. And some other duplicate product gets into the box and gets delivered to the clients. These are stories we've been reading in newspaper. So any experiences or any stories that which you have, which you want to share about the incidences which can go wrong? And hence, how do we go about looking at those incidences or risks? Yeah, so um, yeah, these these risks are clearly there. And this is probably the topmost risk when you're outsourcing that, you know, you are probably outsourcing a part of your capability to a third party and uh, you are mortified about a situation where you could run away with it or you could commercially exploit it without your knowledge and this very very prominently exists in manufacturing uh, setups that uh, you are uh, this thing so i think uh, organizations take a balanced call on this because uh, obviously the most sensitive part where such a risks exist i think it would be very difficult and i'm sure the organizations wouldn't want to outsource that core part of it and expose themselves to a risk but having said that uh, there are instances of controls that are you know exhibited like the coca-cola formula uh, which mr robin uh, talked about i think uh, those are kind of uh, you know controls that can be you know exercised where even though you are outsourcing some of the transactional uh, nature of the uh, processes but i think the core ingredient etc is still under your control and under your watch so I think those those are some of the ways that organizations invent really to stay in control. But yes, you even in spite of best of your uh, ability to m monitor this, I think uh, once you have them outside, you do certainly run a risk which you have to be conscious of and uh, you know establish controls to be overcoming those challenges over a period of time. So I think those are really some of the things that the organizations uh, particularly have. Hello. We lost you briefly, but I think uh, thank you for all the inputs. Interesting. Uh, Jignesh, if you can touch upon a few of the risks which you have seen uh, while doing audits, etc., also and otherwise as well. I think uh, Robin has made my my job a little easier, right? He actually spelled out uh, the risk that I was about to talk about. So no, nothing much to add. Uh, maybe you know, in terms of one of the other risk uh, which I spoke about as part of the diligence process, is uh, also around you know, in terms of third parties being compliant uh, with the relevant regulations, right? Especially, you know, uh, he, Robin gave a good example of a lot of multinational companies outsourcing, you know, to markets like Bangladesh, Cambodia, and if you look at the practices that exist in those emerging markets, and especially you know, in terms of with respect to compliance with relevant regulations. I don't think, you know, in terms of there is so much of seriousness around that, right? So that's one additional risk that I would want to highlight in addition to whatever, you know, has already been spoken uh, by the earlier panelists. And then the other thing, the other one important trend that, you know, we are seeing is, uh, you know, in terms of there are a lot of third parties which are providing us different kind of services. They are getting impacted 
by some malware attacks right wherein you know the hackers are demanding some ransom money so that also says right? let's say if your third party application if you're using some third party application let's take an example of a payroll application right and if that application or that entire service suite of services being provided by the third party has got impacted by malware or ransomware then this has got a severe impact on your operations as well there is not much that you can do you know in terms of uh, because if it's impacted it's impacted again going back to the point that i made around having tight clauses in the contract is when you know in terms of if at all you're faced with situations like this it helps you you know in terms of mitigate the risk and claim damages from the third party service provider thank you jignesh i think interesting so uh, with this i think there are so many risks let me uh, go to piyush with the next question so like in terms of piyush uh, what type of governance framework does organizations have and uh, or should have to ensure that these type of incidents are reduced or we have a control or watch or like how i would say a third party management governance framework any thoughts on those sure. so i think uh, like the co panelists mentioned right one is to have a learning right from whatever the uh, risk which are there see it's it's a new ways of working right when we manage the third party uh, processes in outsourced manner so to my mind there are few learnings that you know i could think about right one is that many a times the there is a higher lock in or there are onerous clauses which then at a later stage becomes difficult right in terms of unlock it or it puts a too much obligation second is that there are lack of sls which are there to clearly be transparent and measure the performance in terms of expectation versus delivery third is around some bit of ambiguous clauses are there or there is no visibility around the real time from a data perspective or there could be some risk like mr robin also mentioned as mr mentioned around the ip protection i think first of all i want to say that what are the kind of possible challenges that we face in terms of going through outsourced model now keeping this in mind a governance framework should be designed to make sure that we are able to mitigate these things to the bare minimum uh, again from a org perspective whether it is a core or a non core outsource that depends on the strategy of the company we have already discussed before to say that there is no uh, organizations have become far more open ended to decide which processes to outsource to extend their bandwidth it can be a core process it can be a non process also but clearly what happens is that the whole control part uh, mr robin spoke about the quality control or from a supervisory level that whether it's a in house process or outsource needs to reside within the company so i think organization needs to have a right structure to oversee this and then there are in house teams if a process is in source and then there is a supervisory level in case we outsource a process so i think from a governance mechanism first is to have a right or structure to make sure that we are able to manage the third party vendor oversee from a process perspective like we would have done it from our own team in case of own teams there will be large in house teams in case of outsource there will be more vendors to manage but the supervisory level has to be on a similar manner right second could be to have a right set of diligence done before we onboard this third is right sla measurements that are required so that there is a regular interaction which is there if it's a own process there is a cadence of review on a weekly fortnight or monthly basis similarly there has to be a cadence even when it comes to the outsource i think if these three four processes are or these three four activities are taken care right it would mean that that the outsource process or in house is same it is more about leveraging the expert bandwidth or extending the organization bandwidth right wherever we feel that the expert is lying whether we have a resources in house or whether there is a expert is which is lying outside and we take a leverage of that because organization wants to achieve more or do more set of things within the thank you thank you piyush i think you touched upon three or four interesting things but let me go to mr rajendran with one or two uh, examples like mr rajendran uh, mr robin banerjee touched upon saying that someone in a developing market 
uh, is manufacturing a zara bag what if that bag goes to the zara of course but also the bag gets sold into the open market at a much 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 lesser price now similarly like say there are so many uh, workshops of samsung or otherwise let me talk about a set of box and we read in the newspaper that some organization set of box the locks were broken and the set of box are available in the gray market for a much lesser cost so how does a uh, organization put control framework around these type of incidents not happening mr rajendra yeah i think uh, fairly valid risks uh, you know which organizations face and uh, you know these are some of the very typical questions that uh, organizations have to go through before they end up outsourcing and uh, appreciating these uh, risks so um, you know i don't think uh, i can i can step into the shoes of those organizations to try and see how they should have mitigated really uh, but uh, uh, you know practically speaking this risk does exist uh, for any organization when they do that and um, we have to figure out an model in which we will have an end control on uh, in case of the examples of samsung or uh, zara bags etc you have said where the output is clearly controlled or the use of your technology or your uh, your design or uh, your processes you have a control over how how much of the output will get delivered out of it and some such i think control you will have to continuously exercise to be sure that you are uh, you are not getting compromised because of this outsourcing uh, model uh, so i think that is that is the organization every organization has to think through in case uh, that they have to uh, do this for 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 uh, leveraging some of the benefits of this model sure thank you thank you so uh, let me come to jignesh and then i'll go to robin so jignesh like let me give you one or two other examples so like say uh, when we when we talk about a bank even the credit cards are being manufactured by a vendor a checkbook is being printed by someone else or like even a car repossession someone goes and repossesses the car if someone has not paid the money so like there are these various agencies and uh, there is so much which is happening what if someone misutilizes that information so how do we protect or what type of governance framework do we put across does the organization put across and what do we see as an auditor there is one question there as well okay while we are doing a third party risk audit what should we cover so jignesh any thoughts from you Uh, so i think uh, you know in terms of uh, largely if you look at it you know i think robin touched upon this point around intellectual property right and i think you know especially when you're talking about a manufacturing organization i think this is the most important thing especially you know for a for a company which is outsourcing the core manufacturing operations so then typically you know again uh, going back i think what happens is you know you have to look at it more from a governance perspective right the kind of vendor that you want to get into relationship with you know the kind of contract clauses that you've got there and also you know in terms of coming to the specific risk let's say you know if there is any risk of your intellectual property being stolen and then being misused or given to the market for manufacturing spurious or look alike products then maybe it gets to the point around you know the access rights and again you know maybe let me just elaborate a little bit so we have outsourced a lot of our processes if you look at you know in terms of practically anything and everything that has transactions or which is process related as a company we have outsourced it to third parties now obviously you know in terms of when you do outsourcing at such a large scale you are always at a risk that something or the other would get stolen or maybe you know in terms of this would not be handled the right way so then obviously you know if you look at the trends and if you look at the companies which are also accepting this outsourcing mandates they are also companies of repute right they are also companies which have got strong governance mechanism which have got strong ethical and and control practices so just you know maybe elaborating a little bit on uh, let's take an example wherein you outsource your entire accounts payable process right a company let's say a multinational company typically would be processing around 15 to 20 billion dollars worth of payment through this single window if they have outsourced their entire accounts payable process to one particular agency so then what happens is you know in terms of your it controls become extremely important when i talk about it controls some very small things but very important ones right so the way they access data from the company system that has to you know in terms of be controlled through a flow right through 
through a, 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 a software which is called Citrix, just as an example. Likewise, you know, in terms of when you go and visit the facilities of the premises of this outsource providers, you will see that, you know, their machines would not have any provisions, you know, for inserting pen drive and extracting data. Also on their machines, you will not see that they can access their personal emails. So that is how, you know, in terms of your data gets protected because there is no way that the individual can transfer that data or, you know, forward that data to someone else. So that is how it gets protected. Also, you know, in terms of from a controls perspective, apart from IT controls, there are very strong physical controls also that exist in the premises. Who's got access to the floor, the CCTV cameras, you know, in terms of the kind of checks that are there at the gates, who can enter, you know, the premises. So I don't know, you know, if you visit any of uh, such third party outsourcing premises, you will feel as if, you know, in terms of you are visiting a highly restricted facility. That's the impression that you will get. Because there are a lot of checks, you know, that gets performed. You'll have to show identification. So these are all very small and basic things. But this, you know, in terms of goes a long way in building up a robust control when you are dealing with third party manufacturing oper or third party operations, not necessarily, you know, in terms of manufacturing, but let's say, you know, in terms of any third party which manages your confidential data. So these are the things that become very important. And obviously, you know, as part of the diligence process, as I mentioned, these are some of the important criteria that gets included in the contract that gets evaluated before we, you know, in terms of give out a mandate to any third party. So Dignesh, uh, thank you. I think you did touch upon uh, physical access control, then like maybe uh, logical access control, data protection, where do we keep, et cetera. So uh, interesting things which are coming up and which will have to be found part of the governance framework. Coming to Robin, so uh, like uh, Robin, in many organizations, including insurance companies, telecom companies, like the collection details, like are being outsourced to outside calling agencies and they call up the customers for doing the collections, recovery, et cetera. At times, even to do a product selling, so like out calling. So uh, what should be done with this data? Because at a lot of places we feel the data somewhere gets sold or stolen or whatever. And then we start getting all these calls, all those numbers are on D and D. So one is the data protection, but like overall we are saying that the whole first line of difference is moving outside the organization when we outsource. So any thoughts, Robin, and how do we uh, bring about the governance, uh, our controls around there? Um, let's let's just talk about the governance around data. Right. Data is cash. Data is money. So every company has to first decide whether the data needs to go out to a third party. If I'm giving my data to a telephone caller, I think and I would have assumed that this name and telephone number is not important for me. So therefore, even if it goes in the wrong hands, doesn't matter. But if someone gives away their customer list and gives to a third party, Hamara sab customer ka aap call karo, that's harakiri. That's a big blunder. Because customer list is your data. That is why MNAs take place. Why do you think a large company acquires a small company? They want data, they want a customer list, they want customers to be acquired. Therefore, any organization, the first thing they have to think through is my data important or unimportant enough to be given out? which I'm sure the CFO and internal audit team looks at it. Having said that, you, you, you used a very important word, governance and third parties. While this is not your question, and maybe you will not ask me the question, but I want to tell this for every viewer to understand the governance for third party manufacturing, to my mind, is a big black hole. Why does the Zara or Boss or H&M manufacture their garments in Bangladesh, why does Nike manufacture in Cambodia? Why not any other country? It is because in these countries, these manufacturers, these big brands believe the governance is lax, which means they may not be paying minimum wages. They may be employing child labor and they may be having poor working conditions. And when I use the word maybe, let me tell you they does. I have been exposed to a situation where we were exporting and for, on behalf of multinational carpets under the name of Unilever, manufactured in the back, back streets of Uttar Pradesh and areas like that, north of India. And 
as a multinational, there is no way the third parties could em employ child labor. There were inspectors who would come to inspect child labor. There will be children who will be posted at railway stations and airports to see whether the inspectors are coming. They will somehow inform to this factory saying, as labor inspector is coming, therefore get rid of child labor today. So there was a check and there was a counter check to ensure the child labor continues because that's where you get cheap labor. So this governance issue is serious in, throughout, in my view, in the developing world where third party manufacturers are taking place. These countries are doing very well. They are ex enhancing export, getting employment, but unfortunately, the governance, quote unquote, is still suboptimal. So it is a million dollar question. How, when will the world develop towards proper governance? We will have to see, time will have to say whether yes, we are doing it or not. But many manufacturers, large multinationals are so hard, hard pressed on bottom line that they perhaps, many of them are willing to do anything for bottom line and top line improvement. Thank you. I think you touched upon a very interesting aspect in terms of governance. And I think we go back to what Jignesh earlier mentioned, non-compliance to regulations, local laws, etc. And uh, somewhere we need to bring about those checks as well. Let me take one more question. And I am asking to Piyush specifically because he's, uh, he worked in a telecom organization. But then I would open it for other panelists also to answer. And then we'll go to the, some interesting questions which are there in the uh, Q&A section. So Piyush, like say a telecom operator uh, used to collect all the uh, the activation forms and the K K KYC documents, and they were like being kept with one vendor and in physical storage. And whenever something went wrong, a telephone number was being used for kidnapping or some bribery or call or something, then like the police comes and asks the operator to pull out the document and give. Now, like say when a organization moves from one vendor to another vendor, and there were some uh, millions and billions of documents lying physically. What care should an organization mm -hmm. take to ensure that the whole stuff moves from one vendor to another? There is some logic and at least nothing is lost in the process. Any any thoughts on that, Piyush, and then we can ask the others as well. Yes, sir. Uh, you brought back the memories of around five, seven years back, right? When you know we were managing this process. And telecom has a circle concept. So, you know, it's like India divided into 20 logical geographies. And each or multiple of the geographies would have one vendor attached. Uh, but because telecom became a 20-year-old organization by then, right, this process has started to get matured. And because industry largely operated whereby these processes was outsourced, it's more like a warehousing and a document management system that was sought for, right? There was a proper checklist which was there to say that what is it that resides at a vendor premise. In fact, there used to be designated person from their respective team stationed at that vendor premise to make sure that you know proper process was followed. The document documentation was stored in a logical manner whereby you know that in which stack, right? What are the kind of chronological order of forms which are stored and how the retrieval process is there. So it, it became so much standardized right that you know if there is a customer service team which is responsible for this there were one or two members which were permanently stationed at the vendor premise and then basis that the relationship the sla with the vendors and all evolved actually and even if there were to a process to transition from one vendor to another right uh, because this was more structured because there was larger visibility right this process was far more smooth rather than it being like an ad hoc process, right, when one needs to redefine that. Having said that, uh, moving of outsource process from one vendor to another always is a risk because one is there is a lock-in, right, which means that more the lock-in, it's important that during that period of time, the service level agreements don't go down. Second is that whenever there is a transition, the business performance should not get impacted through that. And third is that even with the new vendor, right set of relationship, right set of legal contract, and then smooth onboarding. But I think these are all nuances of outsourcing process. Any any benefit that you have, there are some cons that you know organization needs to take into account. Uh, these are some of my thoughts that you know how a process which started as a nascent stage, because it became like an industry-wide practice, the process of outsourcing and managing of that 
became a far more structured from a practitioner cadence perspective. Thank you, Piyush. I think what I take from your uh, analysis and discussion is okay, like uh, earlier there was an, a team, a customer care team or a collections team which was doing the work. Now, if there is a vendor, the vendor is again part of that team. Although the team may be very, very smaller, but they have to be involved on a daily basis, regular basis. And like you mentioned, two people sitting on the customer premises, etc. So that means involvement on a regular basis, keeping a daily check, looking at the daily MISs, like Dignesh was talking about the MISs somewhere, and reporting so that you don't get it as a shock later on. You cannot just leave it to them. So any other thoughts by anyone on this question? Like if there is a need to move from one vendor to another, what care should be taken and if, are there any legal aspects which we should take as part of the governance? Any of the three panelists? Otherwise, we've got four interesting questions which I'll come to each one of you one by one from the participants. A quick comment from my side. <clears throat> the controls and risk management for third party, it depends upon the ethos of the third party and entrepreneur. That ethos must be in line with that of the principal. If both of them are in the same page, everything will work. And if they are not, nothing will work. Perfect. So in a way, we are saying that whatever, and Jignesh, I think, somewhere touched upon anti-bribery, anti-corruption. So if it is for the principal, then the principal, the third party, who is a subcontractor, has to follow all of those. And I think those principles will have to flow down to the vendors or the third party contractors as well. Interesting point. So uh, I will summarize uh, after these four questions. Let me just cover these four first. Interesting ones. So Robin, coming to you for the first question. Considering the globalization of economy and third parties operating in multiple countries, what are the various resources available for an organization to perform a detailed due diligence to identify all the potential red flags and place reliance. This question is asked by Fauzan Mohammed. Robin. Fauzan, for doing third party due diligence, we have to appoint another third party to do due diligence like productivity. So there is no other option because the principal will never be able to go around the world to do due diligence. So we have to obviously outsource to another consulting firm and hopefully they have they have been around for 40, 50, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years, and they have their the ethos is same as that of the principal. And that's the only way to do so, because there's no way a principal will be able to do diligence along the world. Um, I have managed a company where we had subsidiaries from Australia to Canada. Just imagine, and sitting in India. And how do you manage? How do you do due diligence for new acquisitions? There is necessarily we have to give it to third parties. Just for a for for this for the sake of giving a name, maybe maybe the Big Ten of India has also branches in those countries, and therefore taking confidence from these Big Ten or Big Twenty firms, you then outsource to their sister companies, hoping that the ethos of the company in India is the same as that of the third parties, and therefore they'll be able to take care of your needs. So yeah, the only way to do that do that perhaps is to outsource and never ever acquire an organization or do the do third party manufacturing unless your own person has gone and visited and seen it in your own eyes own eyes is the first there's the only way to know what's happening on the ground never ever believe on third parties totally i know i'm perhaps speaking not appropriately but as a manufacturer being principal i believe in own eyes principle always Thank you, Robin. And Robin, I think you covered the second question as well. But I'm just reading out for the benefit of everyone. Since conducting due diligence is very critical, should the due diligence process be handled in-house or should it also be outsourced? This was asked by, I think, Raj Srivastava. And I think you answered, Robin. But uh, somewhere, maybe also what I could make out from you is, uh, if it is one entity or if there are different uh, entities or consultants or partners who are helping us in doing the due diligence across the globe, maybe a standard checklist in terms of what is required to be implemented by the third party vendor and what is required to be available to check that can be developed. Yeah. Okay, let me go for the third question to uh, Jignesh. Uh, what are the areas relating to third party risk that internal oil should cover in the scope of work? 
right i think uh, it's a it's a good question considering that you know third party risk third party management is an emerging risk and uh, again it's become a board topic right it's it's a topic for board discussion increasingly we are seeing a lot of traction on this particular topic by regional and global boards as well so typically what we do right as part of our internal audit plan depending on the third parties we schedule a specific end to end internal audit review on third parties right so let's say if we're talking about manufacturing facilities the way we would include any of our own internal manufacturing sites as part of the audit plan in the same way we would also include some of the external manufacturing sites obviously the focus areas when you do your own internal manufacturing as against you know in terms of you go in for a third party external manufacturing would be a little different but essentially you know in terms of when you look at the core of the scope that you want to cover it would largely remain the same and then you know as part of the third party internal audit review i think uh, one area wherein or maybe couple of areas wherein we deep dive a little more is around governance right how do we ensure that the third party is delivering in accordance with the slas and kpis that we've agreed in the contract if they're not delivering then you know what is the kind of root causing that's being done and then corrective actions being initiated so that's again you know around governance and also looking at are we processing the bills of the third party in the right way in in accordance with whatever is stated in the contract especially when you look at the contract that you entered with the third parties there are a lot of commercial clauses which are included right and again ensuring compliance to those commercial clauses becomes an important focus area when you go and do an audit of a third party that's on the process side again you know coming back to the most uh, relevant topic when you talk about third party is around access controls is around logical controls is around you know in terms of how are we ensuring that the third party is not been given undue access to the company system again you know in terms of we also do site visits and ensure that you know whatever physical controls that they've got at the site whether those are adequate and appropriate for the size of business that they've got so again you know in terms of uh, it depends on the nature of the third party right i spoke about a third party which is you know in terms of doing manufacturing for us but let's say if you were to go to a third party which is handling processes for us you know in terms of handling accounts payable then obviously the scope of work would be very different compared to what i just mentioned on the manufacturing side but again you know let's say if i were to look at my global audit plan uh, in every year's plan i would typically have around about four or five areas which touches upon the third party and again you know in terms of as an organization we believe in complete outsourcing and uh, we've done lots and lots of outsourcing which is why it becomes a prominent area for us to focus on and uh, more so the audit committee also expects us to look at the governance that organization has around third parties ignesh really good thoughts and i think you covered quite a lot and i'm sure you will have a detailed plan as well an audit scope and audit plan uh, uh satish i am like trying to take two more questions quickly one to mr rajendran one to piyush and then maybe i'll do a quick time check with you and then we'll just close it so mr rajendran uh, one again interesting question as organizations cannot do detailed evaluation for all vendors how do they identify the critical vendors from whom a detailed risk management should be conducted so i think uh, uh, you know this 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 is sort of starts from the uh, place where i think you need to have the right database of all the outsourcing operations that you would uh, you know uh, you would have done and this could be third party this could be even your uh, you know your associates joint ventures or any any even such organizations where there could have been outsourcing done now having done this uh, i think you will have to obviously define which are cr critical non critical which are of uh, impact non impact etc and then i think post that uh, it's very uh, important for you to uh, be aware as to how do you monitor them i think a continuous monitoring process and tools which enable them uh, is uh, important for you to know you know so in, uh, you know i think the earlier days of having a compliance uh, checklist or in compliance confirmation which were you know a normal routine process to adopt for third party outsourced uh, uh, you know uh, uh, verification i think from there i think we will have to move on to situations where we would have insights into misses uh, happening on an online basis in case those are critical to uh, organizations and i think from there you will need to have empowered uh, 
committees or empowered people who will be able to take quick actions to ensure that uh, the slippages don't start affecting things badly for you. So I think this is an so this is a set of things that the organizations have to plan for and ensure uh, that they are monitoring it on a consistent basis. Right. Thank you, sir. So like keeping a track of what is being outsourced, what is critical, not critical, identifying which is more risky, where do you want to spend your time and energy and how do you want to do a check? So I think quite effective. Good. Thank you, sir. Now coming to Piyush, I think the last one and then maybe we'll try to summarize. So Piyush, what would be more effective way to ensure control over third party risk? Hire a third party internal auditor or in-house auditor consisting of employees within the organization? Uh, again, it, this is an interesting point, right? We started with outsourcing of process and we are ending with, you know, uh, outsourcing or insourcing of the internal auditor. Uh, I think I would say that, you know, like all the panelists have mentioned, right? The control has to remain in-house. The process of performing that task can be in-house or outsourced, right? Which means that internal audit risk plan has to be owned by the company, right? Company should clearly know that which are the areas, lines of business in that map, which are the areas which are high risk, medium risk or low risk, and then accordingly devise the internal audit plan. Now, having done that, whether a plan is then performed by a outsource uh, internal audit firm or there is a team to manage, there are pros and cons of both. But I truly feel that the spirit is that own the internal audit process in-house get the activity performed through in-house or outsource firm, get that expertise, and again, look at the recommendation and track the ATRs to implementation that has to own by the company. Sure, thank you, Piyush. Uh, there is one more interesting question. So as I summarize, I'll try to answer that as well. In what circumstances can we include audit clause for third party contract, how beneficial it is? So like I'll talk about uh, working for a IT, ITS company, and they were doing claim processing. So like medical claim processing for uh, US uh, citizens sitting out of India. So like, again, uh, uh, so like Jignesh mentioned, a physical access control, there was a certain area, demarcated area, only, only people working on that can go inside. Then data could not be downloaded on our computers through VPN networks or whatever. We were accessing data on the client server and we were doing the work there. All, all pen drives, et cetera, were disabled. You cannot take anything outside. No printers on the floor. You cannot print it all part of the contract. It was also written that they can come and do the audit. They can carry out an audit. We, the the, the vendor in India, the third party vendor had to carry out an audit and give a report to them through a, a, a particular level of firm on a regular basis, quarterly as well. So there are all these type of things which are there in the document, in the agreement, and on the basis of which we can make a, uh, maybe a checklist or a scope of work and we can go and do the audit as well. So uh, that is one question which I tried to answer. Now coming to, like i think an interesting discussion and thanks to all the four panelists but let me summarize i think see in any organization uh, whether to go to a third party vendor or not will be again a process and it will start from a level zero to maybe a level two three four five as you call start then initial then this then being an efficient or perfect or matured or whatever we call it, it can be different names so that is one the second, of course, we said okay, like due diligence will have to be done with the right side of vendor and there are multiple points which we touched upon. And then we'll have to put in place a governance framework where we said the in-house team, the operations team will have to be involved day-to-day -day basis and there will be controls which will have to be placed to keep on checking whether we are on the right track. Right type of MISs will have to be circulated on a regular basis. Reviews will have to be done with the in-house team as well as with the vendors. And of course, like uh, the internal audit team in-house or outsource can go and do a checklist audit at multiple locations on a regular basis. And it could be a full scope audit as well. And those checklist audits can be defined and we could have the criteria on which we need to do the audit. So this is what I could pick up from all the uh, uh, discussions today. But it appears very clearly that more and more organizations are outsourcing and it is becoming a very big area and it could be like it, it is worth spending uh, maybe efforts and energy and putting in place the whole mechanism for third party risk management and third party governance. So I think an interesting area. 
and we should look towards it so uh, that is what from my side uh, once again thank you to iia india productivity and thanks to all the four panelists uh, piyush jignesh mr rajendran mr robin and to all the teams behind who are doing this thank you satish anything else that we want to touch upon or cover or can we close it uh um, mr sir thank you thank you for moderating the session and once again thank you to all the panelists for sparing their precious time on this session and uh, we look forward to uh, all of us coming together again the next for the upcoming series as well thank you so much and all, you, although we have got few other questions we'll try to answer back yes we will connect yeah. thank you thanks a lot thank, thank you all thank of you. you thank you mr sir thank you so thank you all thank you everybody bye bye thank you guys bye a big thank you to all the participants as well